I'm very pleased to welcome you for this IIENA webinar. Um, this event is part of the Future of the EU27 project, which is sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, my name is Mari Cross. Uh, we're delighted to be joined today by Minister for Foreign Affairs of Sweden, Anne Linda, and I would like to thank her for taking the time to speak to us. Um, I know the Minister has a particularly busy schedule at the moment, and will have to leave us at 12.45. But we look forward to an engaging and timely discussion in the meantime. Uh, Minister Linda will speak for approximately 15 minutes or so, and then we will go to the question and answer with our audience. Um, you will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And uh, please, please feel free to send your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once Minister Linda has finished her address. Uh, it would be appreciated if you could uh, give us your name and affiliation uh, when putting your questions. And a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are on the record. Uh, you can join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA, and we're also live streaming this morning's discussion so a very warm welcome to all of you who are tuning in via YouTube. I would now like to formally introduce Minister Linda uh, just before I hand over to her. Uh, and Linda became Minister for Foreign Affairs of Sweden in September 2019. Her previous roles in government include Minister for Foreign Trade with responsibility for Nordic Affairs and Minister for EU Affairs and Trade in 2016 to 2018. A member of the Swedish Democratic Party, Minister Linda also served as head of the international unit of the Party of European Socialists between 2013 and 2014. And in her address to the IIEA, Minister Linda will explore Sweden's experience of the COVID-19 pandemic, including the unique features of its response in the wider European context. And she will consider the distinct implications of the crisis for gender equality issues and the particular impact that the virus containment measures have had on women. And at a global level, Minister Linda will reflect on Sweden's pioneering efforts to implement a feminist foreign policy, the first of its kind, as a vehicle for sustainable development, security and peace. So Minister Linda, you are most welcome this morning and I hand over the floor, or I should say, in fact, the screen to you, please. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, as we said, I'm uh, going to another uh, webinar after this, and that is a little bit interesting because we have a network of women foreign ministers, uh, and we have also uh, kept our meeting in this form. And uh, this uh, afternoon, directly after um, my meeting here, we will meet and discuss how the economic recovery needs to be seen through gender uh, perspective and it's a um, female minister from as uh, different places as Spain, uh, New Zealand, uh, no Australia and South Africa for example. But I'm very happy to be here at IIEA uh, and speak at this webinar. I've had the pleasure to visit you uh, in person when I was Minister of EU Affairs. Uh, and it's great to join you for the, this discussion and share our experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic and discuss the implication of the crisis for gender equality issues. I might as well start by addressing the debate whether or not Sweden is going against the grain when it comes to managing COVID-19. Well, we have the same strategic goals as every other country, and that is saving lives, slow down the outbreak, ensure that the Swedish healthcare system will cope with the extraordinary challenges and mitigate the effects on business and jobs. Our strategy is based on social distancing, staying at home with even the slightest symptoms and protecting older and other risk groups. This is done by a mixture of strong recommendations and legally binding measures. And people are following the recommendation to a high degree. They know this is not some kind of tip that you can follow if you want to or not. As one example, during Easter holiday, travels to the most popular vacation destinations went down with 96%. 
It's a fact that trade and our economy has been severely hit and the unemployment numbers are worrying. So no, it's now not business as usual and we are not casual about the pandemic. In Sweden, we have slightly different governmental structure with small ministries and large autonomous agencies dating back centuries. There luckily is a high degree of trust in the state and the autonomous agencies and scientific advisors know this. We are used to listen to scientific advice from our expert authorities and mostly follow them. One reason is that corruption is very low. People rightly believe that recommendation is not because political or economic favors to give the advice. We do know that the virus is highly contagious and high quality healthcare helps. We do not know enough about mutations, immunity, second waves, and the long-term benefits of lockdowns or not lockdowns. In sum, we should all be humble to different natural strategies and focus on cooperation. The COVID-19 crisis affects men and women in different ways. Therefore, measures to resolve the crisis must take gender into account. Women and girls are in the front lines of healthcare and severely affected by economic decline. In addition, they are often outside social protection system. Women still bear most of the responsibility for unpaid work. And when this work is carried out by professionals, these professions are often low paid. The COVID-19 crisis has, share, has shared even more light on these grave gender-based differences. In building back after the crisis, we have a chance to ensure that measures also build back better for women and girls. Violence is the most extreme form of oppression and one of the most serious barriers to women and girls' enjoyment of human rights. In the COVID-19 crisis, women and girls are at particularly at risk of becoming victims of sexual and gender-based violence. Under conditions of quarantine, women and children who live with violent and controlling men are exposed to considerably greater danger. We must ensure that women's shelters and assistance are maintained and strengthened. Sweden has provided more resources to local governments and civil society groups for measures such as emergency housing, telephone helplines, etc. In addition, the COVID-19 crisis, the provision of sexual and reproductive health and rights services are at risk, including prenatal and maternal care and access to contraceptives and safe abortions. Sweden pushes for SRHR globally and has substantially international funding for these issues. In the aftermath of the COVID crisis, women risk being hit harder by the economic downturn. Women's position in the labor market is less secure and women's personal finances are weaker than men's. Given these differences, it is critical that economic crisis response measures account for women's situation. Sweden will be one of the leading countries in a global action coalition on economic gender equality. Sweden has a feminist government and gender equality is at the center of its national and international work. Sweden became the first country in the world to launch a feminist foreign policy and has also launched a feminist trade policy. Sweden's feminist foreign policy is based on the conviction that sustainable peace, security and development can never be achieved if half the world's population is excluded. It's an agenda for change and a result to strengthen the rights, representation and resources of all women and girls. Today, all countries are facing the same crisis and none will prevail over COVID-19 by acting alone. Therefore, all of us must work to ensure that this one built on solidarity and partnership. Governments, the EU and the international community must show leadership. Let me also briefly mention some of the economic long-term effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Although we are in the middle of the immediate crisis with grave consequences for life and healthcare and an economic downturn at hand, we need to keep an eye on the important geopolitical trends and the long-term impact of COVID-19. There are three major trends we can now see in what can only be described as the worst pandemic of our time. First, with hundreds of thousands of deaths and natural lockdowns, we are seeing dramatic economic assessments from the IMF, WTO, ECB, and our natural ministries of finance. The level of nearly uh, newly acquired debt, the number of bankruptcies, and the high unemployment number, both at home and in Europe, and especially the US, risk growing even stronger. Secondly, I believe the critique of multilateral cooperation is damaging to our societies, and the confrontational rhetoric between the US and China is most problematic. We have seen trade wars, threats of decoupling and blame games. All of this is highly damaging for the multilateral cooperation that needs both these countries to cooperate in order to work. The UN Security Council is blocked, and the WHO is caught up in geopolitics. Similarly, we do not have the luxury of putting other pressing issues on hold, such as climate change, poverty reduction, food, water, air security, migration, disarmament, and anti-microbial anti resistance. And don't forget regional tensions in the Levant, Gulf, Yemen, Afghanistan, or South China Sea. Thirdly, the EU must play a more central role now and after the end of the immediate pandemic is over. All EU member states have implemented some degree of limitations to personal freedom as a consequence of COVID-19. This is natural, important political move. But I fear that the pandemic has been an excuse for some countries, including some EU members, to take political decisions that would normally undergo parliamentary scrutiny in a way that is now impossible. It's also a fine line between self-sufficiency and protectionism, and suddenly we are talking of autonomy in Europe. I fear this is a slippery and less efficient and more expensive slope. We cannot abandon free trade, as this would hurt all our economies and lives of Europeans everywhere. I fear the world is increasingly moving in the direction of greater fragmentation, something we must counter. I also fear it will take time to retake what has been lost in democracy, free trade and liberties. It's a fact that no one center of power, be it China, US, EU, or India, can alone lead, much less dominate the world today in any area. Only by coming together will, will we be able to create momentum and produce global change. And that is what we would need today, in monitoring, managing, and curing this current threat. In recovery, the EU must make the case actively that democracy and high normative standards are good for stability, security, and economic growth, even as we grapple with the current crisis. We need to keep EU together. We need to maintain strong relation with the United States, not only for transatlantic security, on which we are all dependent, but also the US key role in multilateral institution and as a key guardian of democracy, human rights and freedoms. I had, for example, a long and constructive talk with my American counterpart, Secretary, State, Secretary of State Pompeo, a few weeks ago. We also need a di decent dialogue with countries that we do not always agree with, including Russia and China. We need them on board, and we need them to be part of the global solution. But also within Europe, we need to work together with like-minded 
to maintain high standards and develop pragmatic cooperation. For Sweden, Ireland is an important partner in this regard. The same is true of the Nordics and Baltics, and we feel a close affiliation to the values and interests of several other European countries. So in conclusion, now it's the time for humility and realism. Now is the time for cooperation, compromise, and a common vision. And I believe that putting a gender perspective on this crisis is essential for full and more equal recovery. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Minister, for that wide-ranging um, uh, address. It's encouraging, uh, encouraging for us to move forward uh, through the pandemic and also looking looking to the future. Um, I'm just wondering when you have mentioned uh, the EU and the strength, uh, the difficulties of the um, international situation where uh, there are certain fragmentations. And uh, I wanted to ask you, um, with the EU role, uh, foreign policy role, how do you think that the EU could help bridge that gap between the US, China, and indeed Russia? I know Sweden has a, a particular foreign policy um, uh, direction on Russia. Can you, can you see a role for the EU uh, to take a more forward position in trying to keep the multilateral um, bridges uh, intact and uh, play a role between China and Russia and um, the US. Thank you. Uh, well, actually, I think uh, it's uh, one of the great strategic geopolitical challenges we have now. How should the EU navigate uh, in the midst of China, America, and, and, and Russia? Uh, we see worrying uh, signs uh, of uh, both uh, U.S. withdrawing from important uh, international treaties like the Open Sky Treaty, which is extremely important for the security in the Baltic Sea region, and, and we are very, very worried for this. We see that the U.S. is uh, withdrawing from um, the WHO, which gives China more room and influence. Uh, we, see, we know, of course, the Paris Agreement and so on. Um, and I think that in many cases, um, U.S. has had legitimate um, um, things to say about Russia not following all the, 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 the things in the Open Sky Treaty, China not following all the, the, the measures that need to be taken in WH, double TO, uh, but they take the wrong conclusion. You, they withdraw and start to look inwards instead of together with EU try to, to get the situation better, or in the ca case of Open Sky um, Treaty, to, to work together with uh, those of us who want to, to change it uh, to the better. Uh, I think EU must be much more uh, forward-leaning when it comes to taking global responsibility. As one example, when it comes to the Middle East, I have proposed at the Foreign Affairs Minister's meeting that EU should have a special envoy for the uh, Gulf area, that EU should have um, um, equivalent to embassy in Tehran, uh, and so on. And I think that the old cliche that EU is more of a payer than a player uh, unfortunately has some truth in it. Uh, but one important issue is, are we um, um, unanimous uh, in EU or are we split and fragmented? And we can see now, much to, to my big disappointment, that we are not anymore uh, united when it comes to the Middle East, for example. We are not even united on those issues that we have agreed on. This is an issue where, where I work um, a lot together with uh, the Irish Foreign Minister, uh, Simon 
who is a great friend and, and some of the others to try to, to get back on track, so to say. We also see when it comes to China that we have big differences in how we re relate and react to China. And I think that we need to come together much more in the member state to be as strong as we could be as a European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I have some questions uh, from the audience um, for you uh, to consider. Uh, from a member of the IIEA board, Peter McLoon has asked, and it's getting back to uh, the domestic situation in Sweden, what was the response among the Swedish population to the uh, chief uh, epidemiologist conference comments in recent days that there was potential for improvement in what we have done in Sweden? And in hindsight, perhaps, uh, would you consider, uh, he might consider his approach to the pandemic? Thank you very much. Well, there was some misunderstanding uh, in the media, not, not, uh, not at least in the international media, uh, in the way that an academic is speaking uh, um, compared to how we politicians are speaking. Uh, he was asked in a long interview if there was something that could be done differently. And he said, well, now we know so much more about the virus, so maybe it would have been possible to do something differently. But he was absolutely clear that the strategy we have was the one that he would have said uh, we should follow. The fact that we did not close our schools up to secondary school, absolutely we should follow. What he said that we might uh, have, we, maybe we should have started testing a little earlier, but in no way going in other ways when it comes to lockdowns and so on and so forth. And for an academia to say that if we have known uh, before what we know now, we could have used some other measures, uh, that's nothing strange with that. And both him uh, and, and many of us were extremely surprised how this was received because it was 100% not the intention of him. And he was very, very disappointed, which, is cle which he clearly stated at his press conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our Director General, Michael Collins, has a question. It's a bilateral question, Minister. He said, uh, some years ago, Sweden closed its embassy in Dublin. Is this a decision that sometime might be considered and reversed? We have a very, very good uh, ambassador for Ireland, but it's uh, home-based. And uh, several of our ambassadors are uh, based in, in Stockholm. And uh, for the near, near future, uh, we would like uh, to, to keep it that way. It's not that we don't have an uh, ambassador for Ireland, it's just that we don't have the embassy. Thank you, Minister. Um, I have a question. Uh, we read a lot. Uh, um, of course, there is a lot of uh, discussion about the huge amount of EU money that's going to come for the, to get over the pandemic and also in the recovery fund. Um, there is uh, quite a lot of discussion uh, ongoing about whether this um, package can be approved. And Sweden has been labelled, uh, rightly or wrongly, as one of the frugal four. Do you, what is your view about uh, the package that is on the table now, um, that is up for discussion on the 17th of June? Thank you. Well, we have always been very, very strict on having your finances in, in order uh, to pay off your national debt. Uh, and uh, um, we have a saying that uh, if you're in debt, you're not free, as one of our former prime ministers said. So uh, we are not very keen on the um, idea to lend so much money as is uh, proposed, then letting our children pay the check, uh, because it, it's not for free to lend. We put uh, EU in, in a debt situation, but uh, we agree that we need to do something for a recovery package, so that's why we will uh, except that EU is going to, to loan uh, money. How much or not, that has to be discussed in the negotiation. We think it should be discussed in connection with the MFF, 
We are not very keen on um, getting grants. We want, uh, we want the countries to get uh, loan uh, uh, in, instead, but with, of course, um, uh, good what will you call? Conditions. with good conditions. Uh, and um, uh, we also think that uh, we should keep a very strict time frame uh, and we should not let this change uh, the way that the EU uh, is uh, financed so that it would be much easier for the future to loan, uh, to loan money and put the whole EU and the member states in debt. Thank you, Minister. I have another question here from uh, Donald Brolicon, an IIEA member. Uh, he thanks you for your presentation. And uh, you mentioned that Swedish citizens trust the small government ministries and large autonomous agencies as corruption is low. And he asks, to what extent is this trust based on the 250 years of strong freedom of information, which is set down in one of the basic laws? And what lessons are there in this long experience for other EU member states? Well, um, we, uh, it was already in um, uh, 1600 and then 1700, um, 1630, I think, and 1700 and something, that we uh, got our way of governing. Um, and the reason was also that the politicians shouldn't be able to have so much influence over um, decisions uh, that was taken um, for on behalf of the uh, of the citizens um, and already since that already since that uh, time um, it has been forbidden for a Swedish minister to um, interpret law or uh, to say anything uh, that is of a decision for an individual. That is called ministerial ruling and is forbidden by law. Uh, and all government decisions are taken uh, collectively. So a minister does not take government uh, decision. Uh, it's, it's, all decision we have collectively responsible responsibility for and this is many foreigners think this is strange <laughs> when you compare that to the system i think the principle of public access to official document is in fact very important because there is an extremely tight scrutiny uh, from journalists and the society um, and this was one of the things that was difficult when we became members of the European Union, where they don't have the same amount of openness when it comes to public uh, access of uh, official uh, documents. Sometimes uh, I think that um, this, um, it could be a little misunderstood uh, that uh, the um, the um, ministers and government couldn't do anything. That, that's, of course, not the case. We just saw yesterday at the, our cabinet meeting, we had had about 30 extra government meetings, uh, taking around 80 uh, decisions uh, when it comes to fighting the pandemic. Everything from uh, economic decision, like take, taking away um, the uh, deducting fee for, for the first sick day and uh, uh, paying a lot of, of um, uh, reco recovery uh, funds to the companies and uh, hiring the uh, amount of unemployment um, uh, benefits. benefits that you get and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so it's not that we are, you know, um, not being able to take a lot of decision, but the authorities also take a lot of decisions that is in other countries taken by the government or even by a single minister. Thank you, Minister. And uh, as was mentioned, perhaps it might be um, uh, a star, some, uh, an example for some uh, uh, examination in the post-19, uh, COVID-19 uh, recovery. 
I have uh, another question from Colm O'Mongon from our um, Broadcasting Authority. And it comes back again. Uh, it's never far away, the uh, COVID-19. It's a question again on the domestic situation. Um, could the minister clarify if Sweden is pursuing a policy of herd immunity, as is, has been widely reported? And if so, given that it's no means clear that herd immunity for COVID-19 is possible, just to see uh, uh, what your view is uh, on, uh, in that area. Thank you very much. Well, I guess I've done, well, maybe it's 50 or 60 international interviews and in every single one of them I have underlined, we have no strategy of herd immunity. And unfortunately, because President Trump said that we had herd immunity, it seems that like it's extremely difficult to get this myth away. We don't have a strategy of herd immunity, but eventually we will get herd immunity because that is what happens when you have a pandemic. Uh, uh, and that is something that will happen uh, um, sooner or later. Uh, and we will see, we don't know with this new virus when uh, herd immunity will occur. But no, no herd immunity strategy in Sweden. Thank you, that's, that's particularly clear. Um, could I ask you, Minister, uh, as I mentioned, that you have a very unusual um, feminist foreign policy and you have an action plan for feminist foreign policy. Uh, could I ask you to assess uh, how successful this has been to date and do you feel the COVID-19 will be an inhibition in, in uh, implementing your, your foreign policy, this unusual foreign policy, which, as you say, is a leader internationally? Well, thank you. When we started with this uh, about six years ago, there was a lot of laughter, um, not the least from, from uh, men. Uh, and now uh, we can see how much uh, effect it has actually had. And we have um, several countries who has now decided to, to pursue uh, a feminist foreign policy. The latest the country were Mexico. But we also have uh, um, the, uh, part or a whole in, in France, in Spain, in um, Indonesia, in Canada. in Canada, and so on. Um, we've said that you should always ask yourself, uh, where are the women? You should look at the resources, you should look at representation, uh, and you should look at rights for uh, women and girls. Uh, that means that, uh, for example, when we uh, decide about our development cooperation, we need to put our gender lenses on. And uh, we have now, uh, as a result of feminist foreign policy, trained uh, thousands and thousands of midwives, as one example, and uh, worked uh, against uh, <clears throat> gender mutilation. This uh, period, we have three um, priorities, is women, peace and security, is the economic and social situation for, for women, and is social and reproductive health and rights. And I can take one example from the uh, women, peace and security. Um, and, th and that is, we know um, for, after a lot of, of studies that if women are part of um, peace treaty, the, uh, the, it's uh, more likely to be a viable peace. Uh, we also know that if women are not part of the um, parties in um, uh, the negotiations, issues like sexual violence in the conflict might not be um, in, in the treaty and might not be, be, be seen as something that should be, uh, that there should be impunity for, for those um, uh, crimes. Um, we um, want to have women in all uh, negotiations. We asked, for example, the YEMI um, delegations that came to Stockholm for a United Nations-led talks on Yemen to have women in their delegation. Uh, unfortunately, only one of the delegation managed to get one woman in. So then we, together with the uh, United Nations, invited a whole group of women 
to stay at the same hotel, which is far, far away from <laughs> at the outskirts of Stockholm, so I really had to stay there for the week. Uh, meaning that those women could get their inputs because they met all the people uh, during the lunches and breakfast and everything. And uh, I met uh, the, the um, Yemeni women uh, who has been active in peace and peace building when I, uh, as the only minister uh, so far, spent uh, a full day in Aden in Yemen uh, and I was so impressed by their insights, their clarity, and um, I was, was really, really sure that things would be better if uh, the women were more involved. But you have to do it consciously. And this is nothing that comes uh, just by chance. If you don't have the gender glasses on, nothing will happen. Thank you. Um... Your last remark, I think, is, is particularly pertinent. Uh, another question from Padraig Murphy, who's the chair of our IIA foreign policy group. Would Sweden still characterize itself as neutral, or would you say you have a special relationship with NATO? Thank you. No, since um, roughly 20 years ago, we changed our security policy from neutrality to military non-aligned. Uh, so we are military non-aligned uh, with a close partnership with NATO and with a bi- and multilateral agreement. For example, we have an agreement in the defense area between Sweden, Finland and United States. Uh, we have a, a special relationship together with Finland, with NATO. Sweden and Finland has a special uh, relationship. Um, and uh, that is how we, uh, we build uh, our secure security. There is no uh, plan and there is no public majority for uh, NATO membership. Thank you. Yes. Um, Sweden and Ireland work together very well in um, military missions abroad, both in the UN and in the EU, and uh, we appreciate that very much. Um, I have uh, a couple of further questions, and I know time is, is getting short. Um, I have a question from our communications director, Hannah DC. It's how, does, how do you see, Minister, the future of the Convention on the Future of Europe, uh, whether it can take place? Do you feel it's, it's going to be worthwhile, or with the uh, health restrictions, will that be difficult? This is the conference on the future of Europe, which uh, Ursula von der Leyen has, uh, uh, has um, proposed, where um, citizens' views would be listened to throughout all of the EU. Uh, it was supposed to start in May, but uh, now it has obviously been postponed, perhaps until September. Do you feel that this will be a useful exercise? Uh, first, let me say hello, Hannah. It's a dear friend of mine, so <laughs> hope you're well. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's a very interesting idea, and I think that uh, uh, we could see in, uh, in uh, several uh, cases where uh, EU has really seriously have dialogue with uh, their uh, their citizens. It has worked. For example, the issue of uh, social uh, protocol. Uh, there was tens and tens and thousands of IDs coming from uh, uh, ordinary citizens all over Europe that uh, could be used in a constructive way. Sometimes it's difficult because you raise hopes. Uh, among uh, citizens that the, um, the ideas should lead to concrete changes in, for example, the status of EU or what EU should do. And then if that is not fulfilled, there could be um, uh, disappointments. So, so I think it's very, very important on how you do, this, do, do these things. Um, so that you get uh, ideas, uh, opinions, uh, that they are being managed in a good way, but that you don't give the hopes that now you will change a lot that from the beginning you know that you will not do. Then there could be a backlash. 
I have been uh, experienced that firsthand uh, when we had our uh, um, referendum on EU, when we invited to, to um, a big conference for, for citizens and then we promised to publish a lot of uh, things and we couldn't uh, fulfill the expectations of, of uh, many people. So the way you do it, I think it's very important. Thank you very much, Minister. We have just um, a few more minutes left. Uh, I wanted to ask a question of my own. Uh, I think uh, there is, is a, a huge upset uh, internationally at the level of domestic violence, which you highlighted uh, in your talk during the pandemic. Uh, the, the figures are, um, are horrifying and uh, uh, astonishing. Um, I'll, do you have any proposal that uh, states can uh, deal with this situation uh, that has um, emerged particularly during the pandemic. Uh, you have looked at it in great detail and you with colleagues, uh, other foreign ministers, uh, have you come to the conclusion that there are measures that could be taken by states individually uh, that can deal more firmly with this, uh, with this situation? Well, I, I, I think that um, the most important thing is to provide more resources and that should be for telephone helplines, for sheltered housing, um, you could all, in different countries they have also come up with ideas uh, as for example in France uh, when they uh, saw that the domestic violence was uh, in the rise, they had a campaign so that you should be able to uh, when when you were were getting uh, recipes from uh, from the, uh, the pharmacies, you could uh, write a, a specific number so that then the the pharmacists know that this is a woman who needs help without them having to say something. So um, it is uh, uh, possible, but sheltered housing, telephone helplines. Uh, we have uh, uh, provided an extra 10 million euro uh, for, for this uh, during, because of the pandemic here in, in, in Sweden uh, and uh, also uh, to, to see to uh, people around to look, look out for this, to have awareness campaigning that this can happen and that people need to be uh, extra aware of women in their uh, immediate um, circles uh, and then ask uh, is everything all right or okay because uh, we know that this is, is happening in many uh, many gangs. That's also reason why we kept our uh, schools open uh, for uh, child abuse because uh, we, we got the expert advice that there is uh, not much ID when it comes to hindering the virus to close the schools. Um, and uh, one effect uh, would be that the children in homes with child abuse, they have a kind of a safe haven in the schools. And that was one, one of the aspects uh, when we decided that we should not uh, close the schools uh, in, in Sweden. Thank you, Minister. I think uh, we are up against the time slot. And as you said, you have a, a very important meeting to attend. You, thank you for, um, for your address and thank you for raising the issues and, and uh, bringing to our attention the very important policy initiatives that Sweden has taken. I think we should wish you well in, in, in the um, action plans that you have put in place and in the forward um, uh, actions that you are taking with your colleague foreign ministers, both male and female. And we look forward to cooperating with you in this regard and hopefully to seeing you again in the future. Thank you again for your address and best wishes. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. If anybody got uh, any interest in the feminist foreign policy, just Google it and uh, you can download uh, a whole uh, bro brochure of what we have done the last five years. Maybe get some uh, inspiration also for Ireland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.